of all, the news for you two is that Mr. Hackett of the National Manpower Service rang to say there must have been a communication breakdown about the two people in the audience, and he will set matters right first thing on Monday morning. Yeah. Who says politicians don't have influence? Mm -hmm. First thing Monday morning. Now, number four clue coming up. Are you ready? This is a musical clue. You standing by, Tommy? Of you course. Are? Okay, hold on. Here it is. Eliza and Henry fought quite a bit. She's no help, but the professor might clinch it. I thought you did that beautifully, Tommy. <laughs> I really do. Thank you. Think of what Beautiful. it's going to cost you. And there's, <laughs> you'll be lucky. And, and, and there's one clue yet to go. But first of all, I have to say that there is a young couple in the audience joining us tonight. Anne Harvey, Barbara and Stephen Cochran. I beg your pardon, that's Anne Harvey. Barbara and Stephen Cochran, is that yourselves? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, God, you're very dark up there. I can't see you at all. Crazy. Maybe you just want to stay out of the limelight. This young couple, ladies and gentlemen, uh, proposed. He proposed to her and she proposed. No, you proposed to him, didn't you? That's right. She proposed to him on the radio program on Valentine's Day. On the radio program. On, one more. And he said yes. And then she said yes. And it did go all right, did it? It did, yes. Excellent. Thanks, Wonderful. Yeah. And right. how long are you married now? Four weeks today. Four weeks. But who's counting? Since <laughs> yes. And it's going on. It's going on. Excuse me. Now. now as everybody in the audience will know, once you get married, you settle in, as it were, and you sort of become lazy, and you don't go out as much as usual, and then she feeds you very well, and you make food for her, and you sit around, and you don't get any exercise. So, in view of the fact that that will happen to you, like all good married people, we are giving you two membership cards to the Tivoli Health and Leisure Centre. <laughs> There you will have for yourselves a year's membership. You will have a fully equipped gymnasium, aerobic studio, fully supervised creche. Well, <laughs> never know. A lovely jacuzzi, a pool, a team of qualified instructors and all of that. A membership card for each one of you. They're on Tonliff Road. We hope you much. enjoy yourselves and use it well. All right? Congratulations to you. Very good. All right. Now. We are still being inundated with requests, and we've taken a democratic vote in the studio. Didn't we take a yes, democratic yes. vote? Yes. <laughs> and it fell to the lot of Tommy to sing the Kabbalah. Guys. Oh, my name is Dick Darby, I'm a cobbler. I serve in my time at the old camp. Some call me an old agitator, but now I'm resolved to repent. With me ink twing of an ink thing of an idol. With me ink twing of an ink thing of an idol. With me roo boo boo roo boo boo randy. And my lapstone keeps baiting away. Now my father was hung for sheep stealing. My mother was born for a witch. My sister's a dandy housekeeper. And I'm a mechanical switch. <coughs> With me ink twing of an ink thing of an idol. With me ink twing of an ink thing of an idol. With me, roo boo boo roo boo boo randy, and my lapstone keeps baiting away. And my wife, she is humpy, she's lumpy. <laughs> my wife, she's the devil, she's cracked. And no matter what I may do with her, her tongue, it goes clickety like. <coughs> with me, ink twing of an ink thing of an idol. With me ink twing of an ink thing of an idol, with me roo boo boo roo boo boo randy, and me lapstone keeps baiting away. It was early one fine summer's morning, a little before it was day. I dipped her three times in the river. And carelessly bade her good day. <laughs> With me ink twing of an ink thing of an idol. With me ink twing of an ink thing of an idol. 
with me rubu bu rubu bu randi and me love stone keeps beating away now Tommy, as a, as a matter of interest riddle me this where did that song come from I learned it from a woman called Mary Toner who lived down the street from us. She kept a little sweetie shop. Her husband was a bread man and a huntsman, Joe, and she had a, a book of songs yeah. that uh, she had written out by hand when she was a young girl. She worked as a servant girl in a pub in the town, and she liked the songs. But there was a great connection between her family and my family because her family were the Kellys who owned a mill in Derry Noose, and all the Kellys were magnificent step dancers. I saw Ned Kelly when he was 94 step dancing at a wedding. Fantastic dancers and he told me that the sign of a good dancer at that time was that you would get a girl out to face you at a party and any good dancer had to be able to kick her apron over her head on the last step of the dance. <laughs> An awful lot of accidents but <laughs> If you were a good dancer, you just you didn't disturb anything except the apron, and he could do it. Yeah. But the Kellys always danced, and uh, my father and his brother, they worked in the mill for the Kellys, but they used to play the music for them. They played fiddles and flutes and things. It's a most unusual little song, isn't it? Is yes, it? and she told me that when she was a young girl, when she went to the parties where she got it first, there were two old men that used to sing it, and when they'd be asked to sing, I don't know whether they're brothers or not, they used to get two stools and sit in the middle of the floor and face each other and some girl would kick off her two shoes and they would take a shoe apiece and hold it between their knees and they'd do the yeah. so on, the two oh, men yeah. facing each other. Yeah. And did she teach you how to do the action? She taught me how to do that, yeah, she was, she was great. Isn't that a lovely story. And that's, that's I remember one night in, in uh, Carnegie Hall, we had sung that, or Tommy had sung it so often, the audience came to expect it and we decided we'd play a trick on him. And he announced the cobbler. A big round of applause, of course. Tommy walked off the stage, and Paddy and Tom and I sat up. The three of us. And we did it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the other extraordinary thing, that so many of your songs, as soon as you start to sing them, everybody joins in. I mean, this must, this must happen regularly in America and so on, where, wherever you go. You know, it was so extraordinary, Gay, when Tommy did come to America. And I met Tommy for the first time in America. And you were asking earlier about where did we get the songs or how did they come about. Uh, it was so strange that Tommy seemed to know all the same songs that I knew when I was young. And I'm sure Tommy had somewhat of the same experience with us. We somehow or other had learned a lot of these songs here when we were in Ireland when yeah. we were young. Yes, but they were songs that were ignored by the young oh people. Oh my then. God. They were all, yeah. all rubbish. I'll tell you why they were, they were songs that were associated with poverty. Is that what it was? Ah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And when we start, when we realized uh, during the folk boom in America that people were asking <coughs> us to sing songs, we were kind of embarrassed not knowing any and initially very timid about singing the songs that we did know. And they got such a tremendous response that we began to stick the shoulders back and sing them out and get a bit of black garden into them, as we say. And get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Yeah. But uh, I think that the, the, the success of the songs for us was very much a part of the American thing. That nobody in America really is embarrassed about anything. And none of the connotations of poverty that might have been attached to the songs in Ireland were there. And when we came back to Ireland singing them, the people here, that, that thing was infectious. They began to listen to us and say, if they can sing them, God, we, we can, can sing them. We can all do that. My mother used to sing that. Joe Kelly.